we're talking about uh, postmodernism and Marxism versus postmodernism. So the first question we should probably ask is, uh, why should we talk about postmodernism? And commonly, postmodernism refers to some philosophers and set of ideas that uh, were written, or the, these philosophers wrote their main books in the 1960s and uh, to 80s, roughly. So is this even relevant today anymore? And we would say it is very relevant today, actually, because uh, ma many uh, elements and features of these ideas have actually seeped into all kinds of areas and have, become, have come to influence not only social sciences and philosophy majors at universities, but also political organizations, uh, movements, and even mass media. And examples um, are ideas, these ideas of intersectionality, identity politics, post-colonialism, queer theories, some ideas of are present in the climate movement, and so on. So when we look at the roots and the basic concepts, um, if you could call it like that, of postmodernism, um, we're talking about a quite prominent trends uh, that we need to be able to answer and to defend Marxism and put forward Marxism against them. And uh, as I said, so-called postmodernism em emerged, or the main text, the famous text, emerged mainly in the 1970s, um, right, right after the 1968 movement, and some in the 1980s. And uh, the most famous books uh, uh, associated with this are written by uh, names like Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, Lyotard and Baudrillard, and others. <coughs> Now, as Marxists, uh, we know that ideas don't simply fall from the sky. Uh, there is a reason why any set of ideas emerges and gains influence in, in a certain time. So in order to understand where the postmodernism uh, trend comes from, we first want to look at the historical context uh, in which it arose. And um, I'm sorry if I'm, I, I try not to be too long-winded, but I think it will be helpful to understand this. So at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the contradiction of, uh, of the capitalist system were carried to the extreme and showed for all to see that the system had outlived, really, its progressive role in history. Um, imperialism had thrown the world into the great sl slaughter of the First World War, directly followed by a revolutionary wave that swept across the globe. And the bourgeoisie and its ideas were in an impasse and, and incapable of explaining the developments uh, that capitalism had given rise to. So uh, the, there, the, the bourgeois philosophy's uh, view of, of reason, rational, rationality, and mechanical imperialism couldn't really grapple with this new phenomena in science and in society, like quantum mechanics, cosmology, the imperialist crisis. Uh, and these things contradicted uh, their old schemata and, and, and threw philosophy into a crisis as well, bourgeois philosophy. And so bourgeois philosophy at the beginning of the 20th century uh, was to reduced uh, to extreme narrow-minded logical positivism on the one hand, uh, where they tried to find very abstract mathematical formula to explain the world and, and only accepted directly observable, like superficial, measurable facts. Uh, and then, of, on the other hand, all kinds of mysticism that emerged. And actually, the, the postmodern trend was a direct expression and continuation of this trend uh, of intellectual skepticism and pessimism of this time, as I will try to show in a moment. So in the meantime, of, of course, the working class had found their own philosophy and worldview that could explain the contradictory nature of capitalist society and also of nature itself, and, and bring the ruling system's contradictions to its own uh, revolutionary conclusions. Um, and, and these were the ideas of Marxism, of course, uh, which were fiercely opposed by the bourgeoisie that tried to discredit and destroy the influence of Marxism as, as much as possible. So in this crisis of capitalism, the working class, uh, capitalism's own grave digger, uh, entered the stage of history, directly threatening the power of the capitalists with the Russian Revolution and a number of other major revolutionary events that really shaped the whole period uh, between the world wars. But uh, the leadership of the large uh, workers' parties, the social democracy, and then later on um, Stalinism, they were not willing to see the struggle against capitalism to its end. And on the contrary, they betrayed uh, these uh, countless revolutions that happened at that time. And, and on the basis of this betrayal of the working class and the massive destruction of, world war, of the world wars, capitalism was given a new lease of life uh, with the post-war boom, with new technologies, and so on. Um, and, and so this is the setting and, and the background in which the postmodernists wrote their, uh, their texts. <clears throat> it was in a time when the massive uh, process of, of colonial revolutions in Latin America, Africa, and Asia was taking place in the post-war period, uh, but they did not, did not lead to like democratic worker states and international socialism. And, and then 
There was the May 1968 uh, movement in France. Uh, France was shaken by a huge uh, revolutionary general strike that openly posed the question of, of who should have the power in society, the workers or the capitalists. And again, this movement was betrayed by the Stalinists, who went to compromise with the ruling class and, and led this revolutionary movement into safe channels of capitalism. So the, the people, the postmodernists that we're talking about, um, they were all uh, academic intellectuals at universities in the student milieu, and most of them in France. Um, I read the names; uh, really, they were, most of them were uh, from France. And there was a mood of like demoralization and pessimism and distrust towards the system. But these intellectuals, they, they didn't understand, and until today, they don't understand the reason why revolutionary movements had failed and fa are failing, and what the role of leadership in movements is, really. Uh, they, they themselves, they weren't involved in the workers' movement, and they didn't have uh, any class analysis of what uh, fascism, they was also still in the mind of people like the horrors of fascism were not that long ago. Uh, they didn't, couldn't explain how it had come to power and why, and why the movement of 68 had failed. Um, the Frankfurt School, the cri critical theory, is a, is a good example of this. Like names such as Adorno, Horkheimer and Marcuse, that you may have heard of. These, these are part of the Frankfurt School, the early Frankfurt School. They were in many ways close to the postmodernists and, and, and influenced the, their theoreticians, if you want to call it that. And <clears throat> in the book, um, Dialectic of Enlightenment, uh, this was written in 1947 and then republished in a new edition again, in 1969, in a second edition, so one year af after May 68, they write, and, and I'm sorry, I have to translate this from the German uh, myself because I didn't have the English version of all the texts at hand, but they, they write in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, what we had set out to do was to show why humanity, instead of entering a true human state of being, is sinking into a new kind of barbarism. And, and they say that they have lost any trust in the sciences and the education system to the point, and I quote, in the that, that in the current collapse of bourgeois civilization, not only academia, but the meaning of science itself has come into question. So this, this feeling that science and technology uh, are actually only means to oppress and to fool us all um, is, is very present in postmodernism. Um, for example, uh, Foucault, Michel Foucault, who was very influential on, on queer theory, and queer theory itself also, they say they, uh, for them science plays a prominent role to, to explain or try to explain uh, the oppression of sexuality and identity. They say that the discourse of science has made us believe that there are men and women and that heterosexuality is normal, and that's the reason why minorities are uh, oppressed. But actually, uh, to say that there is a, such a thing as biological sex is not oppressive per se, it's just a fact. But, and, and only in, if we understand how oppression of sexuality and identities and capitalism are connected can we find a true explanation for um, oppression and how to fight it. But, but here, instead, uh, science is seen as a, as a fiction this, that defines norms um, that have no factual base whatsoever uh, and that oppresses us. So in short, objective reality and truth uh, are being denied, or doubted um, at least. Um, and postmodernists see the fault for all that went wrong in these ideas of enlightenment. <clears throat> um, and this is a common theme in postmodernism as well. Uh, what they understand as modernity starts roughly from the Renaissance and emer the and emergence of capitalism, and includes uh, the ideas of, of liberalism, of enlightenment, but, but also of Marxism. So to them, these are all modern ideas, and as the no name postmodernism uh, indicates, they, they see them as outdated and, and even dangerous. So the, the ideas of, of reason, of rationality, and so on, that had shaped enlightenment, industrialization, and modernity, in their eyes were already carrying the seed of fascism and degeneration of, of society and civilization. So on the, uh, what, what did they do instead? Um, on the other hand, they, they blame fascism, the horrors of fascism, but also the horrors of capitalism, um, not on the failed revolutions and the bad leadership that led to the defeat of revolution, but, but on the psychology of individuals and the masses. And, and this is not only uh, uh, done by the Frankfurt School, but by postmodernism in general. They have this obsession with psychoanalysis and psychology, 
uh, which they use as a sort of individualization of problems in society. For, for example, they frequently make claims such as the Oedipus complex or the nuclear family or consumerism of workers are responsible for the evils of capitalism. And, and thus the failures of, of histor historical revolutions, they analyze as the mistake of individuals, of, of the masses, of all, all of us really who are complicit in this. And we're complicit by default because we're part of this society. Um, for example, the book Anti-Oedipus uh, by Deleuze and Guattari was, was written under the impression of the movement of 1968. I think it was published in 1972 or so. And uh, they were both quite enthusiastic about the movement actually, but they didn't understand its failure. And as the name already shows, they interpreted it in uh, this event in, in a psychoanalytic, psychological way. So in it, they argue that the Freudian concept known as Oedipus complex, I won't go into this detail now, but it's not that relevant, and the nuclear family, they make us all accept repression and submission and actually like that we're oppressed. So that's the real problem here. So what we need to free ourselves to, to, is to accept our wild desires and become schizophrenic. And, and they write, what counts is not the authoritarian unification, but rather a sort of infinite spreading. Desire, desire in the schools, the factories, the neighborhoods, the nursery schools, the prison, etc. And they say, as long as one, uh, as one alternates between the impotent spontaneity of anarchy and the bureaucratic and heretic coding of a party organization, there is no liberation of desire. <clears throat> so it's quite absurd, actually. So they, they sense clearly that something with the bureaucracy of the workers' organization and with this party organization, like the Communist Party of France, uh, that something is not right there and may have to do something with the failure of 68. But all they put forward is an alternative, is to unleash desire and, and glorifying schizophrenia, really. And, and this, is, uh, this shows how completely reactionary these ideas are and that their non-explanations cannot help any revolutionary movement to actually like, win and overthrow capitalism. Um, yeah, so I said, uh, as I said, uh, the main proponents of postmodernism, they were all from France. And, and in the intellectual milieu at that time, uh, it was kind of trendy to be radical and against the system, uh, but uh, none of them were actually involved in the workers' organization. So Foucault, he was a, an inactive member of the French Communist Party for a few years, and then later stated in an interview that he had joined uh, without having read any Marxist literature himself. Uh, instead, he'd read Nietzsche and Heidegger and, and other pessimistic and idealistic philosophers. And uh, it's also interesting, like these postmodernists, they also all knew each other. Like Foucault was a pupil of Althusser, uh, whom you might have heard of. He's, yeah, it's like he's called an enhance of Marxism, new, new Marxism, but actually um, he, was, he paved the way for like, a, a very reformist uh, torsion of Marxism. And, and Derrida was a pupil of Foucault. Uh, Deleuze was a friend of Foucault's. Uh, Derrida was friends with Paul Deman, who was uh, from Belgium, but taught in the USA and actually popularized this idea in the US and so on. So it's really a clique of intellectuals, if, the, if you want. They, and even today, they all know each other. Um, it's like, yeah, the, they're all buddies. <laughs> so um, they, they don't know Marxism, really. And they haven't read, read much about it either way. Um, Althusser, you could argue, has read Marx. He wrote a book about uh, capital, and, and in it he says uh, the, the worst thing about capital is that it's dialectic. That was the mistake Marx made. Um, but <clears throat> what they say, what they, what they saw of Marxism really was only the Stalinist caricature of Marxism that they experienced in the, in the Stalinist French Communist Party of, of, of or, well, yeah, what they saw. And I, I think the Communist Party of France at the time, there must have been probably a, a suffocating place, uh, not only, but also intellectually, because the CPs and the Stalinism popularized a very mechanical view of society. So when so-called left intellectuals uh, criticize Marxism, what they really attack um, is the Stalinist caricature of Marxism most of the time. Um, uh, often when the way postmodernists talk about Marxism is, um, yeah, 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 like they say, it's, it's only about economics and reductionism and so on. But often, the way they talk about Marxism and, and when they mention Marx, it's so, like, really ridiculous and so obviously not in any even remote way what Marx has said ever that it can't be seen as anything but pure slander. Like, for example, Deleuze and Guattari write, and, and I'm sorry, I have to translate from the German again, and I'm not always 100% certain what exact terms are used in English for this. Uh, because they also tend to invent terms as they go along and see fit. 
But if any one of you has any question about the sources and where to find what, you can ask me later. But <clears throat> so they write, Marx constructs a concept of capitalism by defining the two main components, naked labor and pure wealth, with their zone of indiscernibility when wealth buys labor. And I don't know if uh, many of you have already read the Communist Manifesto or any other work by Marx and Engels, but I assure you that they do not, most certainly do not talk of naked labor and, and pure wealth. Uh, they talk about wage labor and capital, and they even decidedly differentiate between capital and wealth. And moreover, there is no zone of indiscernibility there, but a very clear relationship of exploitation of labor by capital. So why, why destroy a nice piece of prose with such thing as, thing as facts, right? But this is really a, um, just slanderous. <laughs> and, but this distortion of Marxism um, and attacking it while pretending to stand on the same side or pretending to attack it from, from the left, so to say, was and, and still is actually very useful to the bourgeoisie. Um, for radical students who were repelled by Stalinism, and this sort of subtle and intellectual and academic critique uh, of Marxism sows serious doubts and skepticism towards the ideas of Marxism. And, and this is today, uh, important today as well, and one reason why we must so decisively combat these ideas of postmodernism, identity politics, and so on. <clears throat> For example, I mean, it's almost compulsory in, in feminist circles to start any mentioning of Marx with the claim that, uh, or the disclaimer that Marxism doesn't understand the root of women's oppression, plus Marx was a white man and also sexist, and Marxism only cares about factories and economy and stuff, and can't explain household work and so on. And this is completely wrong, but it has the, for the ruling class, very useful effect of, of discrediting Marxism uh, from the left, uh, so to say, uh, for those who actually want to uh, fight capitalism, it confuses. And, and there's a CIA report from 1985, uh, which is called France, the faction of the left intellectuals. Uh, and in fact, it directly proves how happy the ruling class is and was about the so-called left intellectuals. Um, and the report says, even more effective in undermining Marxism, however, were those intellectuals who set out as true believers to apply Marxist theory in the social sciences, but ended up by rethinking and rejecting the entire tradition. And then about a certain historical school, uh, they write, they do this uh, primarily by challenging and later rejecting the hitherto dominant Marxist theory of theories of historical pro progress. It continues, for the most part, they have concluded that Marxist notions are simplistic and invalid. In the field of anthropology, the influential structuralist school associated with Claude Lévi-Strauss, Foucault and others performed virtually the same mission. So Foucault would him call himself post-structuralist, they call him a structuralist in a way, it's details. And they say, we believe their critical demolition of Marxist influence in the social sciences is likely due in to endure as a profound contribu contribution to modern scholarship both in France and elsewhere in Western Europe. Uh, and actually, this is exactly what uh, many postmodernists and queer theoreticians, such as Judith Butler and so on, and Foucault say, like Marxism is simplistic, uh, it only cares about economics, it's class reductionist, as to say, and we should reject any motion of uh, historical progress. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I have already talked about some common themes of postmodernism that are prevalent in uh, all areas that have been influenced by it. Uh, this feeling of pessimism, uh, a sense of doom that technology and, only, and science only serves uh, to oppress us, uh, a rejection of historical pro progress, an individualization and psychologization of problems in society instead of explaining how the root of problems is capitalism, uh, a rejection of reason and rationality since these are ideas of modernity, uh, but I want to go a bit more systematically into the philosophical questions they try to answer and, and explain where they're coming from. Uh, because uh, it was already said, um, one uh, main and the very fundamental, uh, one of the main and f very fundamental opinions um, of postmodernism is uh, that there is no objective truth and no objective reality. So to postmodernists, the whole world is actually made up of language, of narrative and of discourse. Uh, and, and they ho have all this sole focus on the role of language. So to them, the way we speak about the world 
constitute what the world is. Uh, there is no real world beyond language to them. Uh, and this they also call anti-essentialists, so there is no hidden essence, as they would say, behind words. Um, Jacques Derrida, for example, has famously said there is nothing outside of texts, and Lyotard, who coined the term postmodernism, um, refers to the whole world as a language game. And Chris Whedon, a, a post-structuralist feminist, writes, uh, again translated, sorry, um, she writes the following, language, far from reflecting a given so so societal reality, constitutes social reality. Language is not expression and naming of the real world, there is no meaning beyond language. And uh, Baudrillard, he's probably the craziest of the postmodernists, um, he says, it is no longer possible to manufacture the unreal from the real, to create the imaginary from the data of reality. The raw process will rather be the reverse, to reinvent the real as fiction, precisely because the real has disappeared from our lives. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, from, from this proposition that everything is actually made up of narratives and discourse, they argue that the old big narratives have become outdated and failed, and so we need new trendier narratives apparently. And, and with big uh, or, or meta narratives, what they really mean is any systematic view, worldview, that can explain what is happening and, and why. And, and here they lump together all modern thoughts uh, such as Marxism or liberalism, the ideas of enlightenment and so on. And again, Lyotard, um, I quoted earlier, the, the one who like, majorly coined the term postmodernism, he defines postmodernism as, quote, incredulity toward meta-narratives. And he says, our incredulity is now such that we no longer expect salvation to rise from in these inconsistencies, as m did Marx. And, and with inconsistencies, in this case, he means the contradictions of capitalism. Um, in this context. So, so he doesn't believe that any positive outcome, such as a revolution and socialism, can come from the contradictions of capitalism. So if uh, the so-called big narratives are no longer valid, uh, how do they explain what is happening in the world and why? And the answer is they don't. Um, to them, the world is an obscure network with many small individual points of reference, but no causal or definable relationship between them. Um, it's a chaos, uh, so Deleuze and Guattari actually call it chaos. Uh, there are no laws, no clear laws, except these imaginary laws of narratives. And, and even though they reject what they call big narratives, they do not at all reject their own narrative, which is that the whole world is made up of narratives. So, um, while they always claim that they're very critical and want, to dis and want to question the very foundation of all we believe, they themselves base their philosophy on, on a quite big assumption that the whole world is made up of stories. <clears throat> However, not just any stories, not big narratives, but only small, individual, and partial and disconnected ones. So Foucault, for example, says in The Order of Things, uh, one of his major works, if there is one approach that I do reject, however, it is that which gives absolute priority to the observing subject. And then, um, it seems to me that the historical analysis of scientific discourse should, in the last resort, be subject not to a theory of the knowing subject, but rather to a theory of discursive practice. So it's open to all kinds of speculation about the world, but he wants to reject, what he wants to reject is a worldview that assumes that we, the subject, can know the world and that we can explain it. So this, this is uh, scored out. Anything else? Yeah, sure. Let's talk about it. Uh, and uh, I mean, if I tell you that uh, the whole world is only made out of words and nothing except language um, exists, you would most likely, um, and rightfully so, call me crazy. And yes, these ideas are quite delusional. Um, <clears throat> but in fact, I mean, they're, they're not really believing it, right? I mean, the, the way the, these authors write uh, makes it very clear that their texts are not any serious attempt to actually understand the world. I mean, they just write for the sake of writing, really, uh, which incidentally is in full line with their sole focus of their theory, which is language, and has the nice and very real-worldly side effect of selling books and guess, getting professorships at universities and so on. Yeah. So, but <clears throat> uh, back to these philosophical uh, questions. Um, because, yeah, it sounds absurd, but I mean, um, it's not out of nothing that they uh, discuss uh, what the world is and whether we can know it in the way they do. Because actually the question, um, 
whether there is such a thing as objective reality and whether or how we can know and understand this has always been a, a major a central question in philosophy. And I, I want to take a short detour uh, and, and delve a little deeper into this question because I think it will help us to understand not only postmodernism, uh, but also why it's so reactionary and also what uh, the Marxist answer to it is. <clears throat> So the answer, the, the question that is uh, being posed by them really is uh, what is the relationship between uh, the things and objects around us and, uh, and our ideas and thoughts about them? Um, so this is the question of the relationship between matter and idea. Uh, and, and this question of the relationship between matter and idea uh, rose to uh, new relevance when science advanced and we were actually able to deepen our knowledge of things um, in, the, in the 19th century and so on. And, and generally, there are two uh, big philosophical camps, as Engels explained it, uh, the idealist and the materialist camps, camp. And uh, maybe, maybe some of you have attended uh, the philosophy talk yesterday evening, and there have been an, a few other very excellent uh, leaders on this, so I won't, won't go too, de too deeply into this. But um, I think it's still um, important to, to mention it a bit. So idealists assume that ideas uh, and words and concepts are the star starting point and the origin of the world. So in the last instance, the, the primacy of the idea um, actually in an idealist worldview can only mean like a godlike spiritual existence because where else would these ideas come from really when if not from nature and the world. Um, and according to the idealist view, matter and objects are only derived from ideas or even identical to ideas. Uh, materialists, on the other hand, recognize that matter is primary and that ideas are derived from matter and that uh, ideas are actually the highest expression of matter. And as Marxists, we're materialists, we're dialectical materialists, and we recognize that there is an objective material reality, an outside world. world. And as humans, we are part of this reality, we are part of nature. And the material world around us is constantly changing and evolving. Uh, and this movement of mat uh, matter uh, follows certain laws and patterns. And there is such a thing as cause and effect and, and laws of motion according to which matter moves and develops. And since humans are part of nature, our bodies and our brains themselves uh, are obviously also governed by these laws. And therefore, we can also recognize the world we are part of and understand its laws. Um, so our brain is a material organ and it consists of matter organized in a certain way, way. And as Marx wrote in the German ideology, he said it the following way. The phantoms formed in the human brain are also necessarily sublimates of their material life process, which is empirically verifiable and bound to material premises. Um, so this is Marx. <clears throat> so through our senses and, and through our interaction with nature, we can observe its patterns and generalize laws from it. Uh, laws that actually really do exist, like we can recognize the laws. And this, however, doesn't mean that ideas are simply a, a direct and static re reflection of nature. On the contrary, ideas can have a very profound impact on reality. Because these ideas can be used to ma manipulate nature and, and thus change it. For example, if we observe an apple tree and, and learn that from seeds and a, a tree grows, which then bears fruits, uh, we can use this knowledge and then plant seeds strategically and, and build an apple orchard and then harvest the fruit systematically and get apple juice and whatnot. So in other words, um, through labor, uh, we test out our ideas in practice and transform the world through it. Uh, and this is how humanity has actually progressed from primitive societies uh, with almost no technology and uh, means to, uh, to consciously influence our surroundings so that now we have like big cities, technology, a huge productive capacities uh, today. And here also lies the answer uh, to the question of what truth is. So uh, there is an objective reality and yes, we can also recognize it and uh, find truth. Um, the world is infinitely complex and changing all the time. It's impossible for us to know absolute truth, like everything. Um, however, we can we can gain relative knowledge and truth by testing out our ideas and, and um, approximate to truth, uh, pa find part truth. So if I I our ideas are an accurate of reflection of the world that gives us a deeper understanding of how it works, we can test this out. And Engels said, through practice and labor, we can turn the thing it in itself, like objective, the objective world, into the thing of, for us. And, and it is no accident at all that these uh, philosophical insights of Marxism uh, were made at a time where science was progressing fast and giving us a real 
uh, ever deeper understanding of nature, really. So through experimentation and labor, we can test out our ideas and develop and deepen them. And this is how we consciously change the world. In other words, only if we truly understand how capitalism works, can we consciously work to overthrow it. Uh, and this is, was what Marx meant when he famously said, uh, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. So now with this in mind, uh, I think it will now become much clearer to understand what, what postmodernists are saying. Uh, they, of course, completely ignore or distort what, Marx, what Marxism has to say about the relation between matter and idea. And they are actually moving backwards in the history of philosophy and take at, as their starting point uh, the ideas of Immanuel Kant, a German idealist philosopher who lived in the 18th century, uh, and uh, Friedrich Engel, Frederick Engels uh, in his book Ludwig Feuerbach and the End of uh, Classical German Philosophy. He describes Kant's philosophical position in regard to idealism as, and materialism as um, agnosticism. So ultimately, uh, no one can evade the choice between idealism and, ma and materialism, but, but Kant was trying to do just that. And, and uh, these postmodernists, they, uh, they take Kant as starting point. Um, Kant recognized that uh, material reality does exist. He, he called it the thing in itself. But he thought that this reality cannot be truly known because by default, we would impose our pre preconceived categories onto the world and thus interpret it without being able to determine whether our interpretation of the world that we see is actually accurate. But then, if he says this, then the next question arises, where do these categories actually come from, right? And, and then Kant went on to argue that these categories come, uh, that, come, uh, for, uh, that, that form our ideas are given to us by reason, which is an inherent uh, a priori ability and gift of humans. And then in the end, it's, he's a bit in a pickle, and he ends uh, by saying like, in, in, this reason is somehow given us, to us by God. So he proposed a sort of dualism, uh, matter and idea as separate spheres, and tried to evade the question whether, um, of whether matter or ideas are primary, but in the end he had to decide, and he chose idealism. So what the postmodernists are doing is they pick up the question Kant posts and then completely fail to answer them, really, they try to. So actually most of them argue against this Kantian dualism, where matter and idea are completely separate spheres, and in fact they want to get rid of this dualism, uh, and this is partly their uh, justification uh, of why they are attacking reason and rationality all the time, uh, because they say this is this uh, dualism and so on. But they don't always manage to do so, and most of all, uh, they don't do so in any sensible way. So Derrida um, really spends hundreds of pages in his book Criminology of trying to argue against reason and logocentrism, as he calls it. Uh, and, and these postmodernists they want to resolve the relationship between matter and idea, but without ro resorting to this uh, reason that Kant evokes. But uh, their attempt to do so actually leads to them to either stopping at the incomplete and nonsensical agnosticism that Engels described, which is nothing but an hidden, a hidden idealism, or it leads to them actually cancelling out the material part of the dualism completely, like leading them to pure subjective idealism, really. So sometimes they would say, that the thing in, it, in itself, the objective reality, is uh, something we cannot talk about, um, assuming, in fact, an uh, agnostic position, a Kantian position, where the thing in itself may, may not exist, uh, we cannot know. And at other, other times, they openly deny that the thing in itself, objective reality, exists at all. Uh, but in any case, they are quite certain that we cannot truth, and uh, in fact, to ask for truth is an impermissible question that shouldn't even be asked. So Deleuze and Guattari, you see I like them a lot, um, they, they, they say, we thus have no concept of truth, and they say, philosophy is not about knowing, it is not truth that is its striving force, but ra rather categories such as the interesting, the notable, or the important. Um, so this is how they arrive at, at their fantastic point of view, that there is nothing outside of language, um, i.e. out of our concepts and ideas, our ideas are just a permanent self-reflective network that reproduces itself. And it leads to quite fantastic um, so-called analysis of, of reality. Um, and, and I'll give you a few examples. <coughs> um, for example, a, a certain professor called Wolfgang Müller-Funk uh, wrote a piece in a newspaper two years ago in which he explained how narratives create reality. And he wrote, a glance at the narrative clearly shows that so-called facts are not a simple matter. What we call factual events 
are actually mediated by narratives which connect bigger, uh, different events in a cunning way through time and casualty and turn them into a bigger union. For example, they connect the overthrow of the Tsar with the October Revolution. Um, so note here that time and causality are for him just cunning inventions of this ominous narrative, not actual relations between matter. But also, what, what is this professor telling us about, about the greatest event in human history, really, the October Revolution? He says there was no real relationship between the February re Revolution that overthrew the Tsar and the October Revolution. So, so how did the October Revolution uh, happen? Or wh wh what was it? And he doesn't tell us, but countless bourgeois ideologists uh, have filled the gaps that he purposefully leaves open here with slanderous lies, uh, with their narratives, like uh, it was an evil coup by Lenin, who was a German imperialist agent. So Mr. Müller Funk's non-explanation leads to either useless or openly reactionary conclusions, really. Another example is Baudrillard, who wrote a book, a collection of essays, uh, uh, which is called The Gulf War Did Not Take Place. And in it, he argues that the Gulf War was not actually a war. It was, uh, it was only a television propaganda spectacle, really. Um, and only what we were told through the narrative, only the most superficial and simplistic um, si uh, expression of the war, the images on TV, um, is what, uh, what, what made this war a war. Um, it was not a real war. Um, uh, but like this, like understanding imperialist interests or finding a way to end the suffering and the deaths of hundreds of thousands uh, that were killed uh, has clearly no place in his worldview, right? It's only about the narratives and the images on TV. And the very same Baudrillard also explained, okay, I, re I read it, it's really funny, um, by representing things to ourselves, by naming them and conceptualizing them, human beings call them into existence and at the same time hasten their doom, subtly detach them from their brute reality. For example, the class struggle exists from the moment Marx names it, but in no doubt exists in its greatest intensity only before being named. Afterward, it merely declines. So, supposedly class struggle was at its greatest before it was named by Marx, but it was only created once Marx named it. But ever since it was named, it hasn't existed anymore. <laughs> and, and this is complete and utter nonsense. And it's not only historically and factually wrong, since there are class struggles happening right now, and they were happening before Marx named them, uh, which he didn't even do, I mean, yeah. Um, but even the sentences themselves are contradictory and nonsensical, right? So I think this is sufficient to show how unserious and frankly completely reactionary these kind of ideas are when it comes to understanding the world in order to change it. And in fact, uh, these postmodernist ideas, these postmodernists are not radical at all. They're actually again and again argue that there's no alternative to the present system. So yes, they say sometimes the ruling system is oppressive. And, and they say this is because all the narratives and discourses in society are oppressing us and, and telling us to live in a certain way. But at the same time, they repeatedly state that you can never escape this oppressive discursive reality. The power of discourse and narrative is in their view omnipresent. It shapes our way of thinking and of living so deeply that the best we can do is to show through their amazing um, philosophical writings how oppressive it is. It is. So they say if we, do the, if we do this, if we show this, then slowly, get, gradually, maybe we can shift the narrative in society toward a better discourse. And uh, Michel Foucault famously said, re said resistance is never in a position of exteriority in relation to power. And David Halperin, a, a defender and big fan of Foucault, sums up his ideas uh, in the following way. <clears throat> Resistance cannot stand in pure opposition to the powers that be, but uh, struggle and change always take place through co-optation. That, that, in fact, change is made possible by co-optation uh, co because in the process of co-optation, in assimilation, the, the resistance, the terms of power change. So uh, this is a completely reformist approach, really. Um, it basically says, or not even reformist, but anyway, it, it says uh, the ruling class will always adapt and co-opt resistance. Uh, and this is here uh, portrayed as a very good thing, because once we are absorbed by the ruling order, we can maybe change the system from within. Uh, and here it becomes apparent um, what kind of role these uh, ideas can play in movements and class struggle and uh, in, in uh, reformist workers' organizations and so on. Because with this set of ideas, 
uh, it's extremely easy to argue that there's nothing to do but to talk differently about problems, to identify and address oppression, and that's all there is to it. Um, it's a philosophy that is, uh, is the perfect excuse for politicians, leaders, and bureaucrats who want to talk a lot, uh, generate votes, but do nothing substantial to improve, improve the living situation for the masses, but instead uh, just want to profit from the perks of working within the system to change it. And, and this has, in fact, already been proven in action. The idea of a left narrative and left populism gained quite, quite a lot of popularity in recent years, uh, when new left parties such as Syriza in Greece and Podemos in Spain uh, witnessed a sudden surge, and important proponents of these parties uh, referred to these ideas. So the leader of Syriza, Alexis Tsipras, he was able to form a left-wing government in the wake of the financial crisis of Greece, uh, in Greece. And um, he had the idea that he would change the hegemonic discourse of austerity in Europe. So he went to meet the Pope so that the church could spread anti-austerity ideas, probably. He refused to wear a tie in public to give a symbol of radical change. Uh, he appeared, appealed to bourgeois politicians in Europe to change uh, the idea that austerity is rational. And he demanded that the Troika of austerity, the uh, European Central Bank, the IMF and the European Commission, they, they should no, no longer be called the Troika because it's such a negative word. Um, and of course, uh, Merkel and the others, they laughed and gladly stopped to use the word Troika, uh, at least in the open, but, but they crushed the will of the Greek workers nevertheless and forced through brutal uh, cuts, really. Um, of course, there was no resistance to austerity by the ruling class of the EU. And, and those who could have re resisted and who started to do at the time were the workers and youth of Europe. And instead of changing the narrative and going to the Pope, uh, Tsipras, he should have appealed to the working class of Europe. So the, the Greek comrades of the IMT of our organization at that time wrote actually, after, right after the elections, no illusions in negotiating with European capital and its institutions. Our opponents are the capitalists. <clears throat> Interests, local and foreign, that are hiding behind the Troika. Our only true ally is the European working class. Um, but yeah, th this, this was, no, uh, was not the, the idea of, of uh, left narratives and so on. So in fact, the, the, um, the working class as such uh, is seen as completely irrelevant to postmodernists. Um, to them, they're just one of many identities created by narratives. Uh, Marxists, on the other hand, argue that the working class is the only force in society that can overthrow capitalism, exactly because it's objective and real role in the capitalist mode of production. Uh, but Chantal Mouffe, an another a quite famous defender of the idea of a left narrative and a left populism, um, she was recently asked in an interview whether the, her strategy of a left narrative and left populism maybe must be considered a failure since Syriza in Greece, Podemos in Spain, Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, Bernie Sanders in the USA, they all have suffered uh, defeats recently, right? Uh, and her answer is, I am not at all of the opinion that the time of the left populism is over or that now it, uh, is the right time to return to a traditional left politics that is to class politics. Um, and she also says, I have never been convinced that the pandemic would open up a window of opportunity for progressive politics. And today, I'm rather pessimistic. So these lefts, they really, they cannot imagine a world without exploitation and oppression, and they're infested with pessimism. Um, that there is subjective idealism uh, that at first glance seems radical. In the end, it's just the twin of, of just normal bourgeois uh, um, ideas. Uh, in, in practice, both stand on the same side of the barricade, or land on the same side of the barricade. Uh, that, that, these so-called left liberal, these left liberal demands, uh, when detached from class struggle, even if they uh, happen to be good demands in some cases, if they're detached from class struggle, they can't stop the profit mongering of the capitalists. Uh, in, instead, these demands are being taken up as tokenist concessions by the capitalists sometimes when it suits them and are being implemented in the interest of the capitalists. Like we have seen uh, how the CO2 taxation uh, demand of the climate movement is being implemented by the EU as a protectionist border tax against uh, uh, China, basically. Uh, we have seen uh, the bourgeoisie adopt a gender neutral language, like in Austria now even the police force does that on Twitter, use this um, asterisk to gender. But the systematic oppression of, of LGBT people and women isn't touched at all by this, right? And it, in, in practice it was exactly these uh, narrative-based postmodern and reformist ideas that have confused and damaged numerous mass movements in the last years. Um, like leading figures who adopted these ideas uh, did not pose the question of power in crucial moments and did not challenge the capitalists, uh, but instead gave in to the pressure of the bourgeoisie. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, in, in Chile, for example, the demand of overthrowing the billionaire president, Piñera out, it was channels into a dialogue about the Constituent Assembly. The Black Lives Matter movement, where police stations were uh, set on fire and applauded by the majority of the US population, and, and the demands such as abolish the police were raised. Uh, but this movement was then channeled into a lesser evil presidential election campaign uh, for Joe Biden, and so on. So the task of Marxists is to clear the way from all the clutter of bourgeois ideas, to really make room for those ideas that can really show a way forward for the working class and youth. Um, and this important task of the ideological struggle helps to shorten as much as possible the painful experiences of the masses when they have to test out uh, useless reformist and bourgeois ideas and leaderships. So um, uh, if we were to give in to the pressure of uh, such uh, reformist and postmodernist uh, ideas, we would be forced to go down the road of decay and decline of these outdated ideas. And this at a time when the crisis of capitalism has made, made revolutionary ideas as appealing as never before, really. Um, we cannot let the decay of the capitalist system and its ideas drag us down this, uh, uh, this, this road of pessimism and defeats. Uh, Marxist theory enables us to understand the underlying process that processes that are taking place and the instability of capitalism. And, and the, the, the direction of historical de development is very clear. Capitalism is its, in its deepest crisis. No matter uh, which way the ruling class moves, it only digs itself deeper into contradictions. Uh, the working class is stronger in numbers than it was ever in history. And in the last years, the workers, the youth, and the oppressed masses have started to move and clearly say no to, to the, the barbarism of the system in, in countless movements and revolutions we've seen. But um, to say no, uh, it's a very good starting point, but it's not enough uh, to, in order to realize the dormant potential that is there. So we need a positive answer of how to overcome capitalism. And Marxism has these answers. Marxist theory is the generalized experience of, of history and, and, and the revolution. And with, uh, with these ideas, we can lead the, the coming revolutions to victory. So that's what you get. Thank you.